board. Okay, great. So I'm going to share my screen. We're going to go over the questions that you guys picked. Then we're going to take a little break. And when we come back, we're going to do some final exam Jeopardy. Sounds good? Yes. <laughs> it's going to be lit. All right, great. I'm also going to mute my camera um, because I am streaming from home today and my internet is absolute garbage. That does better if I don't take it bandwidth with my beautiful face. So there we go. All right, by the way, if you ever have a question while we're going over this, feel free to chime in over your mic or uh, come into the chat. So if you see a probability question on the final exam, it's going to look something exactly like this. You're not going to get any weird ones with marbles or drawing cards or just plain old numbers. You're going to get something that looks like this. So we look at vehicles and record the color and economic status of the dryer, drivers. We have lower class, middle class, and higher class. And then for cars, we have red, blue, and white. So I'll give you a second to write that down as I can see some of you are jotting furiously. All right, just let me know when you're done. Thanks, Tiffany. Miss Ellie, are you done writing? Okay, cool. Emily's done. Everyone's done? All right, cool. So the first question is find the probability a randomly selected driver has a red car. So if we look at the row for red, we're gonna see that we have a total of 45 people with red cars out of 133 total. So our answer for this would be 130, or I'm sorry, 45 out of 133. On the final exam, I want you guys to leave your answers in this form. So don't write it down as a decimal, don't write down the equation, just leave it in that form. I'm also going to have that proclaimed at the very beginning of the problem. <clears throat> All right, the next one is find the probability that the driver selected was middle class. So if we look at the column for middle class, we see that we have a total of 52. So the answer for that one is going to be 52 out of 133. Again, just leave your answers in those forms. You don't need to simplify them. You don't need to put them in decimal form. Just leave them just like that. The next one was a probability that a randomly selected driver was middle class and driving a white car. So we want this person to have both characteristics. So we want the person to be middle class and driving a white car. We have 13 people that fit those characteristics. So that is going to be 13 out of 133. All right, the next one is that somebody was lower class or driving a red car. So for this one, we're happy if somebody has the characteristic of lower class or if they have the characteristic of driving a red car. So since this is an or probability and we have people that overlap in both categories, this is where we're going to do that subtraction. So we're gonna take the total of people that were lower class. So we have 32 of those people. Add to that the number of people that were driving a red car. So it would be 45. But in adding those 32 or lower class folks and the people that were driving a red car, 
we counted these 13 people twice. So we need to subtract them once. Oops. And then divide that by our total. So the final answer that I would like to see on the exam would be 64 out of 133. I'm going to pause here for a second. How are you guys feeling? Is that looking okay? Any questions so far? All right, good. All right, now this is everybody's favorite kind of probability, and I'm being super freaking sarcastic, by the way, <laughs> is the given. So when it comes to doing a given probability, like the probability that somebody was higher class given they were driving a blue car, what the given part means is that we're only going to be looking at the people that were driving a blue car. So in this example, we're only looking at these people. So what the given part gives us is that's going to give us the denominator. So we're only looking at 55 people. And out of those 55 people that were driving a blue car, want to know what's the probability that those 55 people may have been higher class and we have 31 people so remember the given part so given they were driving a blue car that information is going to give you what your denominator was all right Again, I'm gonna pause here for just a second. How you guys doing? Good? Right on, right on. Awesome, thanks Savannah. All right, the next question that you will see on the final exam is finding the mean standard deviation, the median and the IQR for a set of numbers. <clears throat> so on the final exam, you're going to get numbers that are going to be in this format. So there are gonna be a list of numbers with commas in between. I did that on purpose because I'm trying to make the final as simple as possible. Not easy, but simple. Don't wanna throw you guys a bunch of loops, okay? So here's how I want you to do this problem. On the final exam, I'm going to specifically say, use technology. So, I'm going to walk you through how I want you to use technology. You're going to pull up whatever technology you like. My favorite technology is Desmos. I'm going to go to graphing calculator. Now, once I do that, I'm going to give it my list of data. So I'm going to put L equals hard bracket. And then this almost feels like cheating, but it's not. I'm going to copy the list of numbers from the question, and I'm just going to paste it into that list. From there, I'm going to use those neato commands to tell me what the mean of my data is, the so mean parenthesis L parenthesis, the standard deviation, remember that's S-T-D-E-V of L, the median of L. Now there's no simple command to do this in Desmos to find the IQR, but you can type in quartile L comma one and quartile whoops, L comma three. And that will give you the first and third quartile, which you'll use to calculate your IQR. So for this problem, my mean would equal 32.83, which again, on the final exam, I'm going to tell you how many decimals I want you to round it to. I'm going to put that the standard deviation equals 22.25. The median was 38.5. And the IQR 
remember to calculate the IQR, you're going to have Q3 minus Q1. So in our case, that's going to be 46 minus 12, which is going to give us an IQR of 34. So use technology on these guys for sure. Oh, I didn't know you could do L equals stats. Well, now I'm going to try that, Alex. Thanks for that. L equals stats. That didn't work. Stats of L. Oh, no freaking way. Oh, that's so cool. Oh, Alex, thank you. That just made my day. You're the best. All right. Gosh, you guys are so smart. I love it when you tell me things I don't know. That's awesome. Yeah, I agree, Savannah. All right, does anybody have any questions on this before I move on to the third question? Is my speed okay? Am I going a little too fast? Okay, cool. If I am, don't hesitate to hop on the mic or the chat and be like, yo, girl, slow down. I remember yesterday when I was trying to, I was doing like the review, final exam review, and I got a question like this. And I was like, uh, I, I couldn't remember how to type in the quartile thing on Desmos. And so I just, I, I couldn't figure it out. Well, I'm so glad that we're going over this today because that's something really simple that I don't want you to miss points on. All right. So if we have a left skewed graph, is the mean greater than, less than, or equal to the median? So a left skewed graph means that the mean is being pulled to the left. So it's in the name, left skewed means that the mean is gonna to be to the left. So that means that the mean is going to be less than the median. And then if you have a right skewed graph, that means that it's gonna be pulled to the right, which means that the mean is gonna be greater than the median. This is 100% a question you're gonna get on the final. Okay. <laughs> Oh, thanks for that tip, Alex. Alex put in the chat, if you ever forget, you can also click the keyboard button at the bottom and click functions and scroll down to statistics. Thank you, Alex. You're so great. So right. I have a question real quick, because yeah. like, if like a left skewed graph, it's like the tail is on the left and then like the body is on the right, like the monster thing like you yep. told us about. I don't know, I think, I said like when I got this problem in the review greater than because I was thinking like the mean would be on the like the middle on the right on the body side. So the median is going to be in the middle. So the median is going to be closer to that chunk of the graph where the center is or the the hump. And then the mean is going to be pulled to the left because all those smaller values when they're added up are going to make the average seem smaller. Mm. Yeah, so you're getting the we're getting the median confused with the mean, I think. Mm, okay. Yeah. And Emily, you don't have to worry about ordering it from small to largest. You're right, Desmos will do that for you. So you're all good. Great questions, y'all. Now, the other really big question I got on your emails um, yesterday and today was that you wanted a breakdown of when to use proportion tests, average tests, and chi-square, and what are the criteria for each of those, and also how to interpret confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. So for this one, I'm going to get a little bigger area. So for confidence intervals, we're gonna use the proportion test when we either are dealing with a proportion or a percentage. So you'll see a proportion or a percentage in the question. And you're gonna be doing a confidence interval using an average test if you see an average and a standard deviation. So it has to have both in order to complete a confidence interval question. That is also gonna go for hypothesis tests. 
<clears throat> now, when you're doing a confidence interval for a proportion test, what you are going to need in order to calculate that confidence interval is you're going to need p hat, which is the sample standard deviation, or I'm sorry, the sample's proportion, and you're gonna plus or minus z times the standard error. So the z is going to depend on how confident you wanna be. So is the uh, like proportion test and the average test the same as like the Z test and T test thing? Yeah. Okay. Because I I seen that that's one of like the last things the other info to remember. And I just wanted to make sure this was the same as that or not. Yep, you are correct. And then to calculate the standard error, that's going to be P hat times one minus P hat divided by N, which I am going to ask you to calculate on the final. And yes, Emily, we calculate those the same way that we did for the first example we did in class today. All right, and then if you wanna find the confidence interval when you're looking at an average, it's gonna be similar. So you're gonna have X bar and you're gonna have plus or minus P times the standard error. And the standard error for this is going to be S divided by the square root of N. And remember, you're also going to need the degrees of freedom, which are gonna be N minus one. Now for both of these, <clears throat> something I want you to keep in mind is that you are going to be asked to find the standard error by hand. But when it comes to finding the actual confidence interval, you can do that using technology. So you don't need to worry about finding Z or finding T. So you're not gonna have to use that ugly E table or Z table. And confidence intervals aren't something that apply to the chi-square test, so you don't need to worry about it. Now for the hypothesis test, if you're doing proportions, so if you see proportion or percentage in the problem, that means that you're going to complete a Z test. If you see averages and standard deviation, remember you have to have standard deviation or you can't finish the problem. That's going to be a T test. And if you see a two-way table or categorical data, then you're gonna be doing a chi-square test, which is in the name chi-square. All right, now you guys were really good about setting up the null and alternative hypothesis for all of these, especially when it came to single or double proportion. But I still just wanna let you know what the null hypothesis looks like so that you guys have an idea of where to start. If you're doing a proportion test, the null hypothesis is always going to be that P equals some percentage, so some claimed percentage or proportion. If you're working with averages, your null hypothesis is always going to be that mu, whoops, mu equals some number, so some average. And when you're dealing with chi-square, it's always going to be these two variables are independent. 
hey, chi-square, stay in your lane. Sorry, I didn't bring my uh, document camera, so I'm just kind of fumbling through life today by typing. There we go. All right, now I'm not gonna write the next part down because you guys know this. You know this. After you run it through the technology, you find the p-value. And if P is low, you reject HO. You guys are dynamite on that. You already know that. Yeah, so uh, Tiffany Mew will be the average for sure. All right, the last thing I wanted to go over for each of these tests is going to be the criteria that you need to meet. So remember, you only have a good test if you meet certain criteria for each test. So the first criteria for all of them is that you want them all to be random. Sure, Alex, we can definitely do that. <clears throat> now, the second criteria for each of these is that we want a large enough sample, but the criteria for what determines a large enough sample for each is different. So for proportions, a large sample means that we have at least 10 successes and 10 failures. So 10 successes and 10 failures. And we find those by taking n times one minus p and making sure that that is greater or equal to 10. And for successes, we do the same thing. So we take n times p and we make sure that that's greater than or equal to 10. For an average, we wanna make sure that the sample is at least 30. So that's pretty easy. Is it 30 or bigger? Yes or no. And finally, for chi-square, to make sure that we have a large sample, we want the expected value to be at least five in each cell. So when you have all that written down, I know I just typed out a lot. I'm pretty fast at typing. <laughs> um, let me know so I can move on. Yes, mu is the average for the population. Okay, cool. All right, fantastic. All right, this bleeds into the next question, which is interpreting a hypothesis test results. So if p-value is low, less than sig level, then what you always say is that you say, we found significant evidence to reject the null hypothesis. And if the p-value is not low, equal to or greater than sig level, we found insufficient evidence to 
to reject the null hypothesis. Do you guys want me to save this document and email it to you? Would that help so that you're paying attention instead of furiously writing things down? Okay, you should just ask. I, <laughs> I can definitely do that. <clears throat> All right. The next thing is interpreting the confidence level. So the confidence level is always going to have the same or very similar interpretation. We are 95% confident. The true population parameter that is percentage or average falls somewhere on our confidence interval. Can you scroll back up a little bit, please? Of course. Just got to write like that. Don't worry about finding Z or T thing down real quick. Okay. And is that just for the confidence intervals? But like, don't worry about finding Z or T? Oh, don't worry about finding Z or T for the hypothesis test either. The calculator will do that for you. OK, so it's just like in general, don't worry about finding Yeah, that. in general, don't worry about it. And Chase, I'm going to email this document out to y'all so you don't have to worry about writing it down. All right. <clears throat> so remember the confidence interval, what we're doing is that we're looking at a sample and we're trying to estimate the population. That's why we say that we're 95% confident that the population is actually going to be somewhere on this interval. So you're taking something smaller and trying to estimate a bigger picture. All right, number seven. Suppose we have an alternative hypothesis that P is not equal to P naught. So we just think that it's different. Because we're looking for extremes, either really high above P or really low below P, this would be a twin tailed test. And also with that, I wanted to say if your alternative hypothesis is that P is less than P naught, because we think that P is below whatever value we think the population is, this would be a left, left, left failed test. And finally, if you think that P is bigger than P naught, that would be a right failed test since we think it's going to be higher than this one. All right, so far so good. Ooh, this is one of my favorite. What is the distribution of a sample size? Or it should just be of a sample. Remember, if we take a lot of samples over and over and over again, most of our samples are going to reflect the population. Now, are some of our samples going to be a little bit less than the population? Yeah. Are some of them going to be a little bit more than the population? Yeah, but most of them are going to fall around the population. So when you have something that has a high peak in the middle and then kind of dwindles down evenly to the left and to the right side, what is the shape of that distribution? You're right, it's normal, very good. Most of our samples will fall around the population with some lower and some higher, making a beautiful symmetric distribution.
you don't have to write that it's beautiful. You can just write a symmetric distribution. <laughs> this question right here, example five, that is 100% going to be on the final exam. Actually, almost all of these are gonna be on the final exam. Otherwise I would have told you to not worry about them. So <clears throat> here is the major difference between a parameter and a statistic. A parameter is a characteristic of the population and it's typically unknown. A statistic is a characteristic of the sample and it's typically known. So the biggest difference is that one belongs to a population and is unknown. That's the thing that we're trying to answer a question about. The other is that a statistic comes from the sample, which we collected and analyzed, so we should know what the statistic value is. I can't wait for you guys to go out into the real world and be like, hmm, I wonder what the parameter of blah, 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 blah is. I should collect a statistic and you're just going to sound so freaking smart. All right, so with that said, and the other knowledge that I just gave you, when finding a confidence interval, we are using the blank to estimate the blank. So what do you think? When we are finding a confidence interval, we are using what, a parameter or a statistic? What do you think? Ooh, nice job, Riley. I see you mouthing it over there. We're using a statistic because we're using a sample. And we're using a sample to estimate our population, which means we're trying to estimate some sort of characteristic about the population, which is a parameter. <clears throat> All right, I have one last thing that I want to say before we move on to the next part of this um, section. And that is that randomness reduces bias, which increases accuracy. Increased sample size reduces standard error, which increases precision. All right, so far so good? Okay, cool beans. So I'm going to click the save button, even though I don't need to, this is an automatic save. I'm paranoid, I'm still gonna hit the save button. Okay, and I'm going to save this as a PDF and email it to you all after class that you can look it over, print it out, sleep with it under your pillow, in hopes of osmosis. Okay, good. So now that that is done, I'm gonna turn my video on because now it doesn't matter if the video does its own thing. Uh, Alex, you wanted to go over a question that had to do with mean and proportion. 
Can you tell me if you wanted to look at one that was um, a hypothesis or a confidence interval question? He's typing it into the chat. That's why it's taking it. Hypothesis. Okay, cool. We will look at one. I'll make one up on the fly. And I make one up. I mean, I'm going to steal one from somebody that emailed me earlier today. So let's say that we believe that prior to COVID, 13% uh, of students registered for classes the day before the term began. We think that number has changed since COVID. We randomly sample 78 students and find that nine registered for classes the day before the term began. Is this the kind of question you wanted to see, Alex? Okay, cool. All right, so the first thing that you want to do after you get the problem written down, um, which I can email this to you too, so you don't have to wildly scribble on a piece of paper, is we want to state the null and alternative hypothesis. So our null hypothesis is that the proportion of students that wait until the last day to register is still 13%. And our alternative hypothesis is, well, we just think that it's changed. We didn't state whether we think it's going to be greater than or less than. So we would just write that P is not equal to 0 0.13, which means that this would be a twin-tailed hypothesis. All right, now before we go entering this into our technology on Canvas, it's probably a good idea to figure out what p hat is just in case we need it. So remember, p hat is going to be the proportion that you saw in your sample. So we saw nine students register the day before classes. Out of the 78 that we randomly interviewed. which I am going to round to 0 0.1154. Now that we have all that good information, we're ready to use our hypothesis test calculator. So I'm gonna pull that up real quick. Wouldn't be a bad idea to have a list of pulled up when you're doing your final. So I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna to go to technology and resources. I'm going to open up that sweet, sweet hypothesis test calculator. And since I just have the one sample, I'm going to do a single proportion hypothesis test. So our null proportion was 0 0.13. Our sample proportion was 0.1154. Our sample size was 78. All the rest of that looks good. So we get our z-score and our p-value. So when you're writing this into the homework or the final exam, gosh, it's so crazy to think that you guys are about to take your final exam. That's nuts to me. 
feel like I just met you all. All right. So your Z test statistic would be negative 0 0.38. And our P value would be 0 0.7014. So would we reject or fail to reject our null hypothesis if we had a significance level of 0 0.05? Fail. We want to fail to reject. So our conclusion would be at a sig level of 0 0.05, since we didn't say one at the beginning, we fail to reject the null hypothesis, there is not sufficient evidence to show a significant difference in the proportion of students who sign up the day before the term starts. Sure, Emily, we can do that for sure. All right, Alex, did that um, help answer your question? Sweet, you're welcome. All right, let me pull up that review packet real quick. Mm -hmm. All right, so Emily, you wanted to look at unit four, example two. Oh. Oh, this is a great one. Ah. Emily, such great questions. Okay. So the question that Ms. Emily wants to go over is, suppose the age of college graduates under 30 at a college is normally distributed with 24, 1.3. And it wants us to find the following probabilities and also look at C-scores. Emily, is this the correct question that you want me to go over? Okay, cool, cool, cool. So <clears throat> to the first three questions um, on this example, what we're going to do is you can definitely do it by hand. I don't suggest it because you're gonna be doing a final exam and yeah, just why. Um, so what I suggest you do is I suggest that you use the normal distribution calculator, which is going to be in, finding it, finding it, week six. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull that bad boy up. Okay, so we're gonna be using this calculator to do most of our work. So we know that these college students have an average age of 24 with a standard deviation of 1.3. So if we wanna find the probability that a student is 23 or younger, then we can just type that right in there and find 0 0.2209 for our solution. And then if you wanna find the probability that a student is 23 or older, two things that you could do, you could either do one minus this answer because that's going to give you the right-hand side of that distribution, or you can flip it using these toggles down here and it will flip it to the greater than side. 
The next question wants you to find the probability that somebody's in between two ages. We're going to use this button right here. And we're just going to put in, whoops, 22 to 25. So 22 to 25, and we get 0 0.7172. Okay, so I really highly recommend that you use technology to do those first three. It's going to make your life much easier. Now, for the last two, we're not going to use technology. We're going to use formulas that have been, gosh, it's been like four or five weeks since we looked at these. So we have two formulas for the z-score. The first one is z equals x minus x bar divided by the standard deviation. And the other one that we have is that x equals oops, z times the standard deviation plus x bar. So you're going to use one of these depending on what you're trying to find. So for this question, since we have the z-score, we want to find the student's age, we're going to use this second formula here. So to figure out that student's age, which is going to be x, we're going to have negative 1.8 times our standard deviation, which is 1.3. And then we're going to add 24. So when I plug that into my calculator and it follows the order of operations, I'm going to get 21.66. So the student is 21.66 years old. I'm also going to stop for just a second and ask myself if my answer makes sense. And to me, it does. An answer around 20 years old makes sense because a negative z-score tells me that this person's age is going to be below the average. And because it's negative 1.8, that 1.8 tells me they're going to be just a little bit less than two standard deviations below that average. So I like to think about that because I'm like, well, I could have plugged into my calculator wrong or something bad could have happened. So I just want to be double sure that that's okay. Finally, the last question says, who would be older, a student with a z-score of negative 0.8 or a student with a z-score of 0.3? So who would be older? What do you guys think? So even though negative 0.8 is further away from the average, it's going to be lower than the average. So the student that would be older would be the one that has a positive z-score, since they're going to be slightly above the average. So good job, Riley. I saw you mouthing it. I see you, girl. Good job. <laughs> so who would be older? The person with a z-score of 0.3. All right. Emily, did that make you happy? Hopefully. Yes, very. Okay, great. Yay. It makes me happy too because I we went over these equations right here so long ago. I felt like it was um it was a good idea to go over them again. And I'm just gonna highlight that answer. All right, looking good. Okay. Cool. Any other questions?
I do have to say that I went through the um I went through the final exam this morning and I removed like three questions that I thought were hard and replaced them with some easier questions. So hopefully you guys will have a good time. Yeah, I tried to make it um more more fair, more easy because you guys have been through hell this term. So <laughs> You know, not just my class, but just like in general. All right, so nobody has any questions left. So I have a question real quick, and this is also on like unit four. Um, okay. It's the third example. It's like the one question I have about it is how do you determine the possible outliers again? Oh, that's a good one. Um, <clears throat> wall most likely not going to be on the final. I am going to tell you how to do that. Just one second. Um, extra review for math. And I want to make sure I save the file before it goes away forever. So when you want to find the possible outliers, you take Q1 minus 1.5 times the IQR and Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR. And if a number is outside of that range, it's a possible outlier. Sounds good. Okay, that makes sense now. Okay, cool. So wait, why why the one point five though? Just quick question. Um, it is just a value that they use to determine if it's, um, it's kind of like, you know, when we went over empirical probabilities and we're like, hey, if you're more than two standard deviations away, then you're unusual. Mm -hmm. It's kind of similar where they're like, well, if you're more than one and a half IQR away, then you're unusual. It's kind of a mm -hmm. similar idea. Okay. Yeah. So a question in the chat was, we also real quick go over treatment and response variables? Yes. So the easiest way to determine if something is a treatment versus a response variable is you decide if somebody is getting it at the beginning of a study, which means it would be the treatment variable. And then when you want to see how people differ afterwards, that's going to be the response. So the treatment is the thing that you give everybody at the beginning, you know who's getting it, or it's been randomly determined who's getting it. And then the response variable is the thing that you're recording afterwards. So a couple examples of a response variable would be who got sick, um, who's, I don't know, skin turn orange, um, did people's moods increase? Those would be response variables. <laughs> Sorry, Tiffany, I made a joke about my voice breaking up. But I'll type it into a chat and I'll just say it one more time. So the treatment is what we give at the beginning. And the response is the variable we measure at the end to note differences. For example, response would be person got sick, how much weight they lost, if their skin turned orange, et cetera. You guys are asking great questions and very pleased about this. All right, any other questions? Hmm. Hmm. Yes, it can be. All 
I have a question for you guys. Are you ready? If you read the syllabus at the beginning of the term, what do you think is my favorite color? Purple. Purple? I, was, I think it was purple. Yes. In the syllabus, I stated in a secret section that if you actually read the syllabus, to email me the color purple in order to get extra credit. So if you did not do that, let it be a lesson to you to read the syllabus because there might be an Easter egg. Also, fun fact, purple is not my favorite color. My favorite color is orange. Yeah. Yes, Tanner, orange, it's the best color. Whatever, what's your favorite color? Teal? Ugh. Is it grayish? <laughs> what's your favorite color, Tanner? Green. Green's the uh, best color. Green is such a fantastic color. I love that. It's wonderful. Oh, Alex, my son's favorite color is purple as well. All right. Well, with that, um, there's not enough time to play Jeopardy. But the good thing is, is you guys answered all the Jeopardy questions anyway. So, I mean, you didn't answer the wild card ones, which were random questions that I just threw in there, but mm, whatever. So, um, I'm going to stop recording. Let me 